Hello, everybody. This is a talk <clears throat> that will be focusing on one sort of application of ecological niche models and species distribution models, which is the potential for discovering uh, or enabling discovery of uh, new species and new populations of species. And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a little bit of concepts and a little bit more of um, examples. And hopefully I'll be able to illustrate for you one set of uses that we can put these models to. So what this talk is not about is the idea of replacing um, exploration and field sampling. Uh, this is a picture of a, a famous ornithological explorer named uh, Rollo Beck, who did just a truly amazing amount of, of expeditionary work across the, the South Pacific and on various islands in the Pacific. Um, nothing will replace field sampling on the ground in, in uh, remote places around the world. What we are hoping, however, is that efficient use and effective use of models um, can guide and make more efficient those field efforts. So essentially, that's, that's what I want to give you an overview of today. Um, I want to give you first two key principles that if they're not both in place, then this, this won't work. Uh, first of all is the idea of ecological niche conservatism in evolutionary time frames. Um, essentially, there has to be some inertia, some conservatism in the characteristics of niches. We're not going to be able to use related species or conspecific populations to be able to predict where the unknown species or populations are located. And so we need, we need there to be an overall pattern of ecological niche conservatism such that related species and populations will share niche characteristics. The other thing is these methods will be most effective when speciation takes place in geographic dimensions, because that means that the new species will be in suitable areas that are disjunct from, from the ranges of known species. Again, these are two key principles, and if they don't hold, then we don't have much hope of, of using these methods very effectively. But let's go through some, some thinking behind this. So first, let's talk about niche conservatism. I'm going to go back to 1999, so 20 years ago. Um, Jorge Soberon and Victor Sanchez Cordero and I um, published this paper in Science. Um, essentially, what we did was to ask how frequently sister species pairs share the same niche. And we did it using a geographic feature in Mexico called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Um, I'll give you one example. This is um, a tiny little hummingbird called Athis eluisa, uh, and its sister species, Athis eliotai. And here you can see Mexico. And this bottleneck here is called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. It's a lowland barrier, and so a lot of montane species have populations um, to the west and north, and populations to the east and south. And some species found this to be a complete barrier. So think about resplendent Quetzal, which just is to the east and south, and doesn't cross the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And essentially what we did in this project was to take the points, which you can vaguely see here, take the points for one population, 
develop a very primitive ecological niche model and transfer it to the other side of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And you can see the shading there is the cross isthmus uh, projection of the model based on the, the uh, species west of the isthmus. And vice versa, here are the very few points that we have for Athos Eliadi, and this shading is the transfer of that model across the isthmus also. Um, and to, cut, to make a long story short, what we found is that in 37 species pairs, we invariably found um, that those two niche models could predict the occurrences of the other species, the species on the other side of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Here's the rest of this same figure. Um, and again, this is for an example of a, uh, a bird, a mammal, and a butterfly. And essentially what you can see is that in each case, there's pretty close coincidence between the prediction and the points of the other species. We, we use a very primitive index of coincidence. I'm just, we're not going to use it in this course, uh, but basically the higher the value, the better. And so these open circles and this high regression line that is between sister species pairs and these closed circles and the flat regression line that is between confamilial species pairs. And so all I want you to see is that there's a very close correspondence in niche similarity between sister species but not between confamilials. And this was essentially a first demonstration of evolutionary conservatism of ecological niche characteristics. Um, a second example of niche conservatism, uh, a paper not done by me, by, it was done by Mark Benedict and colleagues, um, but essentially, this is, this is using an invasive species. Again, just to look for um, whether there is a single niche signal that applies over most of the distribution of the species. So this is looking at Aedes albopictus. It's an invader. Uh, it's a disease vector. Um, and it has spread essentially worldwide. But let's, let's look at this process a bit. Um, Benedict and colleagues accumulated 100 occurrence points of Aedes albopictus. Those are shown as these white squares. And they related those to climate characteristics across uh, that sector of the world, and they fit this model. And you can see the darkest areas are the areas that are essentially um, most within the, the potential of this species, according to their model. But you can see a couple populations that are out on the margin. And essentially what Benedict and colleagues then did was to take those model rules and apply them worldwide. And the part of that worldwide that we're going to look at is the lower 48 United States. And so this is essentially a picture of the suitability of the lower 48 United States viewed through the ecological niche eyes of um, the native range of Aedes albopictus. Now keep that map in mind, and I'm going to show you how the invasion of albopictus into the United States proceeded. You can see it arrives, I believe, in the 1980s uh, near Houston, Texas. And then I'm going to show you the progression of colonization of counties. And you can see it spreads very rapidly across essentially the eastern uh, third or the southeastern third of the country. But what I really want you to see is this. There's an overlay of where the species has invaded and its ecological niche signature as was calibrated and fit in Asia. And what I want you to see is that this species 
colonize extremely rapidly and extremely efficiently, basically out to the limits of its native range niche. Yeah, there are a couple exceptions. That one would be the worst of them. Um, I don't know if those populations have, have become permanent or not. But again, the important thing is those niche limits on the native range have a lot to say about where this species could invade on a global scale. And indeed, globally, there is a view of the distribution of this species. And so the idea is that because there seems to be um, ecological niche conservatism during the invasion process, we can use the characteristics of our species on its native range over here to anticipate its geographic potential worldwide. Now, a lot of this, um, a lot of this, these ideas I've summarized in a review paper that I did back in 2011. Um, and I essentially want to just show you a couple pieces of that, uh, mainly some equations, um, but we'll make all of this, uh, this literature available to you. Um, essentially, this is an equation um, that we've already talked about in week one, but essentially it's a really crucial bit of, of thinking for distributional ecology. Here's the fundamental ecological niche. M is the area that has been accessible to our species over relevant time periods. Now for Aedes albopictus, probably M is the whole world. But for some endemic species in the central Amazon, it may just be one um, area between two rivers. This operator eta, the Greek letter eta, means the environments associated with, in this case, M. And so what we're saying is that the, uh, the existing fundamental niche is equal to the fundamental niche reduced by the set of environments that are accessible to the species. And the reason why I wanted to remind you of this equation is this. When we get to these questions of ecological niche conservatism, one of the typical questions we ask is whether the fundamental niche of one species is the same as the fundamental niche of another species, in this case, species one and species two. But this equation which basically says that the part of the fundamental niche that we can observe depends on the fundamental niche, yes, but also on the environmental characteristics of the accessible area. And so what we really have to do in order to ask this question about whether two niches are the same or not is we have to say, well, the fundamental niche of species one, given the environmental characteristics of its, of its accessible area compared with the fundamental niche of species two given the environmental characteristics of its accessible area. I don't want to go into any of the details because we have a whole unit later in the course on niche comparisons, but if you look up niche conservatism, you're going to see a lot of papers that pretty typically conclude niche lability or niche change, and a lot of those have done so because they made this uh, very simple comparison but didn't take into account the availability of conditions. So overall, I think it's a fair thing to say that um, the broadest conclusion is one of niche conservatism at the very least over relatively short time spans like between closely related species. And so in that 2011 review, that is also what I found. I um, created, this is old now, but I created a set of comparisons, some of which are very short time, time uh, span, like a species invasion or comparisons across a range or comparisons between sister species and others might be quite a bit older. 
And what I want you to see is that the dominant signal at these younger events was one of conservatism, but once you go to these older events, uh, you start seeing more results that have to do with breakdown of niche conservatism. Okay, another, remember the other of my two key principles was the idea of uh, geographic speciation. And here I want to take a little bit of a walk into the past. Um, if you haven't read Systematics and the Origin of Species, um, you might want to. It's, it's getting to the point where it's more of historical interest, but it's very useful and informative history. It was written by, it was written by a man named Ernst Meyer. Uh, this is Meyer as a very old man. Um, he was quite a bit younger when he wrote Systematics and the Origin of Species in 1942. All I want to do is show you some examples from this book. Um, these are the very famous examples from Meyer's work in the, in the South Pacific. Uh, Pachycephala pectoralis, it's a, it's a whistler uh, in, the, in the Solomon Islands. And um, if you follow the keys closely, you can see that some islands have white-throated males, some islands have yellow-throated males. Um, in some islands... Uh, it's the female that varies in its in its um, uh, in their plumage. Uh, in one island, the men's don't the, the males don't have a uh, a black breastband, and in one island, the males are are uh, they have essentially a female plumage. Uh, and same deal here. You can see uh, essentially geographic. Uh, sorting of different forms. This is in a, a flycatcher, old world flycatcher, a monarch, um, and you can see very different um, feather, plumage patterns, color patterns. But again, the important thing is that this is all geographic. This is all spatial. Okay, two more examples, a kingfisher in New Guinea, um, which Meyer said have, has developed almost species rank in small uh, isolated ranges. You can see the, the geographic separation. Um, or another example in a continent is the Old World Warbler, uh, Philoscopus trochiloides, uh, essentially distributed around uh, the high deserts of Tibet and, and Mongolia and Western China. Again, my point is simply that a lot of speciation takes place or has taken place in, in geographic dimensions um, and so is visible in terms of maps. Uh, the way Meyer envisioned and kind of the classic uh, new synthesis view of speciation is to start with a, a species with no geographic variation and a large range there may be some isolation imposed, which allows differentiation into subspecies. That isolation may become more pronounced, which gives the species some time to uh, evolve differences that either are strong enough that they can come back into contact without hybridization, or that maybe are not quite so strong and some when the two forms, this one and this one, come back into contact, maybe they begin hybridizing. But that's kind of the classic um, biological speciation, uh, geographic speciation paradigm. Now I just want to bring you slightly more up to date. This is 1994, so not terribly modern, but a paper done by Terry Chesser and Bob Zink using a method by proposed by Lynch. Uh, the method has been pretty controversial, so I'm not going to go into um, the details of it, but I simply want you to see that uh, reviewing a bunch of sister species pairs across North America, Chesser and, and uh, Zinc found quite a bit of a dominant signal of either vicariance, which is 
geographic speciation, or peripheral isolates, which is also a form of geographic speciation. And they really found relatively little evidence of sympatric speciation. Uh, and many of us would probably argue that even those weren't really examples of sympatric speciation. Um, okay, so now let's, let's go into some examples. Uh, I hope that I've convinced you that um, many ecological char niche characteristics are fairly conservative in their evolution, and I hope that I've convinced you that uh, at least a good portion of speciation um, ends up being geographic, especially in, in vertebrates and things like that. Um, but let's look at, look at, I believe it's four examples. Here's a very early one um, that I developed with uh, Marinez Siquera, uh, who will be talking later in this course, and a couple other colleagues in Brazil. Um, essentially, what we were interested in is a species of plant. Uh, Bersonima is the species. Uh, but it was known in the state of Sao Paulo, it was known from one place where you see this star. And what we did was we did some very simple uh, matching, essentially uh, ecological niche modeling, but extremely simple. And we generated a bunch of sites um, that were either very similar to the circles, similar to the environmental characteristics of our star, or very different from the squares that are, uh, again, very different from, environmentally, our uh, one occurrence point. And we went out and did a lot of field sampling, and what we found was a whole bunch of additional populations in the very similar sites, and only one additional population that was in an environmentally different site. Um, the point of this is we took a species where we knew nothing about it. We had one spot of occurrence for it in this whole region. And we found a whole bunch more sites. Um, those sites in general were quite similar to the, uh, the one known point. Um, so this is the observed range of values of environmental similarity as compared to the original known point for our six new uh, localities. And then this is kind of a null distribution showing the, the overall uh, similarity of sets of six points to that one point. And so what you can see is that our six points came from sites that were very surprisingly similar to our one point where we, where we had the species localized. And then based on that, we were able to use now our uh, much richer occurrence data set, which I believe was seven points, and we fit a model and we got this revised and improved picture of the different the distribution of the species in that state, in that region. Second example, this one's a neater one. Um, a striking discovery of a 4,000 kilometer disjunct population of wild potatoes in South, South America. This is the plant, and essentially you can see occurrence points as black dots here. You can see the, the niche model that they fit, which shows potential distributional areas in Mexico and northern Central America, a little bit in the Caribbean, a little bit in the southeastern Brazil, and a, a bigger area or a more contiguous area in Bolivia. And lo and behold, they find a new population of this species in precisely those areas. Third example, something that we published now 16 years ago in Nature. Um, this is with Enrique Martinez Mayer, who will also be uh, talking uh, in this course. Um, but essentially what we did was a, a little bit more of a systematic uh, effort. We had these distribution points for the chameleons of Madagascar. 
each color in this map is a different species. And then we fit, they were pretty primitive, but we fit niche models for each of the species here for Buxia at Stumphy. And what you can see is here are the points, and then the shading represents the areas that are suitable according to that model. Again, these are really primitive, and you can see some, some uh, horrible spatial artifacts. But what I want you to focus on is that our distribution of our species goes from here to the northern tip of the island. But that there are other areas that somehow match the environmental profile of our known sites, but don't seem to hold populations of the species. Here's another one. Here's for first for varicosis. It seems to inhabit this whole southern area. But then we have this and this disjunct areas that don't seem to hold populations of the species, but do seem to match the species distributional area environmentally. Here's another fursifer species. And what I want you to see is a couple offlying disjunct areas that are not known to hold populations of this species, but do seem to be suitable. First for Pardalis, so several areas that are again in that same pattern. And the point is, if speciation has been geographic, and if ecological niches have been conservative, then these are precisely the areas where we might expect a sister species, a closely related species to be found. And so what we did was we went to those areas, in fact, uh, in three expeditions to sites that, uh, that were these offlying suitable areas, seven new species appear in those sites, and only one new species appeared in expeditions to sites that didn't uh, fall within those offlying disjunct suitable areas. And so this was seen as evidence that uh, our models had informed us about where closely related species sharing the same niche characteristics in the end turned out to be. Then last example, this is more of a test. Uh, this is something I did with my colleague Adolfo Navarro. Um, but essentially we acted as if we hadn't known about some uh, small range species uh, from amongst Mexican birds. And so, for example, here is a, a, a bush tanager. It's widespread throughout humid montane forest in Mexico, Central America, South America. But it has this one differentiated population out here in the Los Tuxtlas range in southeastern Mexico. Or another one, Dendrotix. Uh, these are, are wood partridges, and there are widespread species such as Dendrotix macrura, but then a relatively restricted range species, Dendrotix barbatus. And so we simply asked, well, what if we hadn't known about the restricted range species, and what if we uh, had been modeling our species of interest? Could we have predicted? where the new species would be, um, essentially better than a random model, at least. And so let me orient you a bit to this table. Um, in the genus Amophila, our restricted range unknown species is species Sumacrasti. But then we have these broader range uh, known species um, that we might have known about and that might have given us a clue about where Sumacrasti would be found if we didn't know where it was found. And I just want you to focus on this, these last two columns. Those are uh, how significantly better than random our predictions would have been. 
And so you can see in this most conservative column, I'll give you the paper so you can read it if you want, we can see that models for three of the species of Amaphua could have predicted where Somacrasti is. Um, same for Amaphua notosticta, which is another restricted range species. Catharus dryus, you can see Catharus, uh, most of the rest of the species are able to anticipate where dryus would be. Um, Chlorospingus wetmori, same deal. But essentially what I want you to see is that in a lot of these cases, knowledge of the well-known species, the broadly distributed species, could have oriented us to where to look for the new species. Okay, that's aiming just to give you a, a quick overview of um, two key principles um, and some examples of this, this potential use of um, ecological niche models in discovering populations of, that might not be known or species that might not be known. And just to point out some of the challenges in this, certainly getting a good robust model of the fundamental niche is a challenge. Um, all of the complexities of model transfer. And then something more, pra more practical is how would you choose amongst the different disjunct areas for survey. Uh, I'm not going to go into these challenges. Um, at least the first two of them are, are subjects of detailed uh, discussion later in this course. So um, just to sum up, um, these models do inform us about the distributional potential of species and lineages because of the conservatism. And thanks to the and lineages, it may tell us about the distribution of members of those lineages that are not known to science. And so that's where this potential for a predictive understanding comes in. Thanks very much. Have a good rest of your day.